This is my film, Your Money, as you can probably gather. My name's Andy Jones, and I'm here as um, a partner to the South African delegation through my operation, which is Operation, gosh, uh, Radio Film, uh, who have been working alongside the South Africans uh, who, are, who are here. And so this is a chance for us all to, to meet together and share stories. And I'm going to just introduce your panel very briefly, but before I do that, I'd, I'd have been developing, some of you will know, I've been developing a new theory over the last couple of days, and we've tested this out. So I'd like to ask everybody to just choose, first of all, either their mother or their father, and then raise their hands if they know where they're from. Okay, so you're choosing your mother or your father. Now keep your hand up if you know where you, if their mother or father is from. Keep your hand up if you still know where their mother or father is from. Keep your hand up if you still know where their mother or father is from. One to four, this is impressive. So does anybody who knows where their mother's 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 mother is from? You're allowed to put your hand down when you don't know. We've got one out, we're gonna get six. The record is six. Do you know where your mother's 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 mother is from? <laughs> Seven. This is impressive. So we have a new record. And I think that if, if my theory is true, you must be somehow connected to some old money somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so with that in mind, uh, our session is going to be, I'm going to shut up and hand you over to our chair, Kaliswa Sitole, um, and just quickly to introduce the rest of the panel so that they don't have to do it themselves. You can do it. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So from my left, um, filmmaker George Amponsa, UK based. I'm going to go to the right, because this is, this is the film and down the end is the money. That's Dion Walker, who's George's <laughs> producer. So George's new film, The Hard Stop, which will be coming out later this year. George, also a director of films like The Fighting Spirit and also The Importance of Being Elegant. He's probably two most famous independent films, but if you ever watch Discovery, not Discovery, National Geographic, you'll find a lot of George's work out there. Anyway, Sinan Keschi, over from Los Angeles, she's pitching her new project in the meat market, uh, which we'll see a clip of. Sinan, also director of Project Kashmir. Then Pascal is where we have Sarah Masters from the Hartley Film Foundation, US-based, very generous grant maker. And then we have Soria Samora from a citizen of the world, we can say, <laughs> with a specialism in Basildon and West Africa. And Dion, as I say, also London based, but your mother's mother's mother. I saw your hand go down early, Dion. You were, you were <laughs> one of the early in London. So a big, a big round of applause to welcome our panel, please. Well, thank you very much for everyone who's chosen to wake up very early and be part of this. I'm going to ask the panelists to just do a quick intro and also to just tell us what they are working on at the moment. And um, to also, since we are here to actually discuss about money matters, you know, my film, your money, and we know that they are, this is an ongoing debate in terms of artistic freedom, artistic independence, the copyright issue, and all of that. So if you could just give us a an intro in terms of the work you've done and what you're working on at the moment and who's giving you the money. And then we can then progress to then talk about, to flesh out the nitty gritties of the challenges that filmmakers are facing vis-a-vis -vis money and their work. Sorry, so I'm Dion Walker. I'm the producer of The Hard Stop. I'm here with The uh, Hard Stop. It's now in post-production. and. Um, and we've garnered funds from uh, Sundance Institute, British Film Institute, and Bertha Foundation. And so I'm quite happy to have a conversation with everyone about how we went about doing that and whether it's, a, you know, it's influenced our editorial process. Oh, hi, my name is Soria Samura. I work for Insight News TV based in London, but um, I do all sort of stories with all sort of um, 
players who would help me to raise the, fun, the funds that needed. But I started from Sierra Leone when, um, you know, the war in Sierra Leone, no one was covering our war, and I managed to raise enough money to be able to theme my country's war. And so now um, I have managed to find my way through the Western media and the broadcasters here uh, seem to at least trust one African or few of us Africans who are now telling more and more of the stories about Africa. Hello, I'm Sarah Masters, uh, director of Hartley Film Foundation. Uh, we give seed grants, we don't give production and outreach uh, for research and development before, as ideas are coming together. Um, we also give, um, so that we can participate in the production cycle, we are now giving two awards a year, monetary awards, for films that we can see, documentaries that are going to have major impact. Right now our focus is on religious uh, films about how religion is affecting what's going on with global issues in the world today. And um, so we are, uh, that's where uh, we are granting, uh, and that's what we do. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sanan Keshki, and I've made two feature, three feature documentaries and quite a few shorts. Most of my work has been in <coughs> human rights, focusing on South Asia, India, and Pakistan. Um, I'm based in the U.S., so it's a little bit of a different game than here, and also on the board of the International Documentary Association, where I work with uh, filmmakers who are interested in fiscal sponsorship um, and a way that you can um, access funding that you may not normally have access to. So I can talk to you guys a little bit about that if you're familiar. Hi, I'm George Amponsa. I'm an independent uh, producer director. Uh, I've been making films for uh, about 25 years. Um, I was born in Britain and uh, I was fortunate to go to art college in the late 80s. I just got into filmmaking, Super 8 films, and um, uh, you know, I was, uh, I think over time I've, uh, I've been fortunate enough to carry on and kind of make it into a living. But I'm very interested in this panel discussion because, um, you know, my career has always been about what, you know, trying to do stuff from that I believe in, you know, because I've always been keen on doing stuff about. Um, people like myself and, uh, uh, you know, of the African diaspora and uh, just anyone who's, uh, you know, got issues or concerns about identity and wants to try and find ways to express those issues through the medium of film. So, um, but it's doing that and also actually making a living and paying bills and, and, and creating a business. And <clears throat> at the hard stuff is my third feature length um, independently produced film. But it's the first one that I've managed to do with, through my own production company. And um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's an ongoing learning curve, this whole thing. You know, my film, your money. So it's very much a, a very pertinent uh, thought uh, process that I'm going through at the moment. So I'm very, good, very glad to be here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, before we actually get into the discussion of my film and your money, in, because I know I'm going to be shot if I don't raise this by certain people. I, I just want to address this question to you, Cyrus, because there has always been a perception of how um, Africans have always been portrayed on television. And um, you were very prolific. You're one of the people who, I mean, I remember watching your documentary on Sierra Leone and how, you know, you were also seriously criticized in terms of um, you made very hard choices in terms of what you captured. And certain people felt that, you know, maybe you had gone too far. But that's not really uh, the point. The point is that in terms of your work, and in terms of how you have done a lot of work on the African continent, I also saw your documentary on um, Ethiopia and the whole issue that was um, surrounding, you know, what was going on in Ethiopia at the time. What creative decisions do you make and how do you push, because I know I've done some work for the BBC and uh, certain African nationalists have always criticized me in terms of saying that why are you airing our dirty linen in public? And sometimes you are caught between uh, 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 and you want to say, this is the issue I want to talk about, but how far do you go? 
and uh, because it's, it's an issue where Africans are grappling with the stereotypes that have always been, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an old story, the race issue. So how have you dealt with that in all your work? Because you are quite prolific. I know you, um, it's a very valid um, question, and this is one that I've always been asked um, wherever I go or when people see. In fact, sometimes it's not even asked. You know, people attack you, um, and sometimes it's your, it's, to be honest, it's not the Africans. It's uh, sometimes the Westerners who, um, in my own case, you know, who are worried about political correctness because there are some things that sometimes my uh, commissioning editors will turn around and say, for instance, I wanted to do um, a program about living, about AIDS. And, you know, the thing about this job is that um, as George said, sometimes um, the, the, the storytelling, you know, the stories that we tell are not new. They've been told over and over and over. So your role is to try and find a way to tell the story so that the story can grip the, the viewers and they can see a different angle. But what is important in those stories is about you asking yourself the question. I have learned when I want to tell the stories to say to myself, I want to walk in the shoe of these people. I want to put on their shoe and walk the distance and see and feel how they feel. Because if I feel okay about it, then I know they will feel. So what I normally do is I, I first of all, go down, spend quality time with the people whose story I want to tell mm -hmm. and try to understand from them what they want me to represent um, um, about them. And that's how I make the decision. But as far as the Western media is concerned, I have learned that what is important is to shock um, um, our audiences because, first of all, you learn to own your material because you're quite right, the footage, the theme of, 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 of Sierra Leone was just yeah. too, yeah. It, it was too graphic. And the broadcasters at the time, everyone said, no, we can't show this uh, because it's too graphic, it's gonna scare people. CNN um, showed it um, around the clock. There were children getting up in Japan to go to school and they were watching this film. So they said, we're not gonna show it. And I sat there, I argued with all the editors, you know, I came from nowhere, but I said to them, if this was Hollywood glorifying war, you would wanna show it. Now these are my real people being killed and you telling me, you not going to show it. I want to shock the people. So it's about you owning your material. It's about you believing what you believe that your people want you to represent. So most of the time, I spend quality time with the people whose story I want to tell. And once they tell me that this is what we want you to represent, I don't care what the broadcasters think. I fight that corner. My dear. Yes, I just wanted to add to that because I, I'm a former journalist. I used to work for CNN and that's exactly why I left the business because I, I was also um, covering some war stories and was told uh, to edit out my material where the, there were some, some things that were quite egregious and, and rough in some of the material and a, a CNN executive actually said, using these exact words, like, can you make it more Mickey Mouse? And that's when I knew that, that it was over for me as a journalist working in mainstream media because the, there is, they're, they're crossing, they're, they're doing infotainment news, you know, journalism slash Hollywood at times. And so, you know, there's no room there to, to push uh, and have longer conversations about things. It becomes 30 seconds. And the owning is the most important thing because then at the end of the day, where, wherever you take the money, you're beholden to those people. And so you have to start that dialogue with people as, as a auteur, as someone who has something to say, as opposed to just wanting funding to make a film or a news piece. George, um, I lived in the UK uh, in um, 19, God, long time, 1990 for about five years. And one of the things that I noticed during that time was actually the lack of visibility of black people on British television. So you only had people like Tony Benn, or you had that comedy series in Peckham. Uh, that uh, one, <laughs> which was- The one that came there. and left, yes, went Yes, came and quickly. went, yes. So, uh, and you are of Ghanaian origin. Yeah. And as a filmmaker, when you started, was I, I, I just need to weed out this race thing. 
Mm. And because I don't want this to degenerate into a race debate. That's not why we are here. But I know people want to talk about this. And um, so in terms of your work as a person of Ghanaian origin, mm. Mm. when you went into filmmaking, did you feel the desire and the need to correct certain stereotypes? And when mm. you have um, gone to the commissioning editors, because obviously the BBC is the biggest employer for mm. people who are making documentaries, you know, mm. and um, other television related stuff, were you conflicted in terms of what you wanted to represent for television as someone maybe who had grown up yeah, here? Yeah. Or have yeah. you decided that did you decide that actually your topics of conversation were going to be about blackness? Because also there's a problem with black people ghettoizing our own yeah, issues. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, th that topic of conversation about blackness has kind of been, I, was, I, was kind of, I think it's kind of followed me all my life in a way and creatively, but you know, I, because I'm British, you know, I was born in Britain. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, obviously, I'm, you know, I was, I, I was, I lived in Ghana from age of about one to, to four, and unfortunately, you know, my mum always took us back to Ghana, mm. so you know, I was never too far away from it, and from that side of my identity. But um, you know, in terms of that conflict, I think uh, by the time I got to art college and decided oh, I want to make and picked up a Super 8 camera and, and 16 mil cameras and whatnot. That was all I wanted to do. Uh, I don't, it wasn't a conscious thing. I just wanted to do, make films that somehow expressed probably the conflict that I had with my own sense of identity. That's, I've never really analysed, but that's just how it happened. And then by the time I, um, by the time I got to the National Film and Television School in the documentary department, one of the films that sort of propelled me there was made by someone who uh, they're fi finally, uh, they're honouring here at Sheffield mm. this, this year, which is John O'Connor, because he made a film called Seven Songs for Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And I saw the film, I was very much, I just read the book, uh, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, around about that mm -hmm. time. And uh, it made a big impression on me and my life and my sense of identity at the time. And I saw the film, and I thought that film expressed everything that I felt I was about and what I was doing, because that was around about the time I started picking up Super 8 cameras. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the credits list, because I always pay attention to credits list, I saw someone called John Acomfra. Mm -hmm. I thought, that guy's got a name. Mm -hmm. And if he can do it, then I can do it. Yes. So, you know, it was, it was quite simple. But that conflict in terms of uh, commissioning editors and whatnot, and uh, I don't know if I, you know, I, I've been fortunate because the independent films I've made, you know, The Importance of Being Elegant, which was, um, you know, about Papa Wemba, the, the, the cult of fashion, this crazy fashion disciples that follow him, the separates. Um, you know, that we took that to Nick Fraser and um, with myself and uh, a colleague of mine, we just graduated from film school at the time, Cosmo Spender. And, you know, we come from different shoes, Armenian of origin, you know, British like me. And, uh, you know, we went there as part of a team, Cosmo had come out of SOAS, and uh, we just wanted to make a, it wasn't a feeling of, well, we want to make a political statement. You know, we're documentaries, and we, we just wanted to make a film, but, you know, something aside of Africa that hadn't been seen, and, um, um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, that conflict, uh, 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 I think I've, one way I found of resolving it is really sort of making a bit of a, a dividing line between the films I want to do through passion, mm -hmm. which I believe in and want to say something about, and you know you have to go around and try and find people, in, funders who are going to back that and not make you compromise that place. Because why would you, you know, why would you do something? Spend all that time and you know these films I'm talking about, including the hard start, which has taken me three years to do. Mm -hmm. Why would you spend all that time and effort and doing something that you don't believe in and you can't, you know, get behind with all your heart and soul and all your sort of, you know, political sense of what's right and what's wrong? <laughs> Sorry if I'm rambling a bit, but uh, it's, it's, yeah. I don't know if any of that makes sense. No, it's fine. Actually, yeah. we, we Can met, I jump in as well? We met at the New York African Film Festival yeah. when you had Suppers right. with Lupita Nyong'o. Yeah. <laughs> it was about 10 years I know, ago, I could, right? Yeah, yeah, I knew she was a star had, even then, but <laughs> yeah, I, was I wasn't in a position to <laughs> sign her up or anything. 
Okay, coming back to you, Diane. Uh, I'm really interested, and I'm sure the panel is interested, in, uh, first and foremost, we don't actually have many black women who are actually producing what else we don't have. We're just not seeing them. And I'm saying most of the time that they are there. Find them. So I'm very happy that you, know, you are part of this panel. And um, I'm interested in how you, your relationship has worked with him and um, what challenges you have faced in terms of um, raising money and at times you, know, you compromise certain things and at times you don't want to compromise certain things. And how has that relationship with the funders and with the director and how you have straddled that? Apart from maybe what it, you wanted to say something, so you well, could say that. Well, I mean, actually, it's, it's connected to this, so you're very, very on, on the mark here. Um, it's, so just to say, in terms of funding, so it ties into the notion of how, you know, the idea of blackness, Africanness, and, and in a sense, I guess, how, how fluid that is because um, both North American funders and um, European funders, I, th I think, come with particular ideas about the, over the overarching narrative of okay. African, Africans, uh, African story in Africa and African diasporic story. And, um, and so certainly with this project, which is set in London, but essentially is, is still is still uh, pretty much a narrative. Of, so it's a narrative about Africa diaspora, but also it actually connects totally to a, mi a migrant narrative, and you know, and connects back to Africa. Um, is it? It was very yeah. It was very difficult to raise funding because you go to typical uh, European funders and and American funders are looking for stories that is set in Africa specifically, and they, they're then looking at the issue generally of um, one that's, that, that's to do with a crisis, a crisis on, on, on the continent. And so this, this is looking at, in a sense, some form of crisis and racism potentially in, in Europe. And so you get, essentially you, get, you do get some form of pushback because it's very hard for, um, it becomes an un uncomfortable thing to kind of say, well, actually, things are happening in your backyard. Can, can, can I say, it's Dion? It's happening in Europe. I do, I, can I just follow on from what Dion is saying and also what Sorius was saying about um, airing dirty linen? Because, you know, it, it's, it's very interesting to me because, you know, I saw Cry Freetown, and I can't remember if it was on the BBC or whatever, but it was on British television. Channel 4. Channel 4, and it was uncut. And there was a, a sequence in it, which I'll never forget, where a, a woman was being beaten yeah. to death by soldiers. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, I, it's, it's a good thing it's called Cry Free Time, because it, it made me cry, and it just stuck in my mind. I could never erase that image. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the idea of that being censored is just kind of ridiculous in that sense. but. I've always, for me, there's always been an irony in that. I think, um, you know, sometimes I've had a sense with um, British broadcasters and funding structures where, in terms of their editorial, is that, you know, they, they, there are certain things that would be acceptable if it's being portrayed, if it's something that's a story in Africa, which might not be so acceptable if it's a domestic story. Mm -hmm. And um, that was never more apparent to me than when we actually tried to go about getting funding for a story which was basically about the UK riot, well, really how the UK riot started, because um, our film, The Hard Stop, is basically about, um, follows friends of uh, Mark Duggan, who's a man whose death sparked the UK riots after being, he was shot by the police in 2011. and. Um, you know, we've spent uh, the last two, three years filming with two of his childhood friends, including the chap who was accused of basically instigating the first riot in Tottenham, which then uh, was spread uh, nationwide. Um, but, 
you know, we in terms of getting funding for the film in the first year and a half or two years, uh, you know, to excuse the pun, we literally couldn't get arrested, could we? Yeah. No. In this country, you know, and the funding, the first bit of funding came from America, and. Um, you know, uh, Dion was very keen that we, 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 we approached the likes of Sundance and, and, you know, very strongly and apologetically say, this is the story behind the new story that you all, you saw. Because actually, you know, England, large parts of England were in flames. It was an international news story. And, um, you know, it became a way of, of selling it. And I, I remember kind of thinking, well, if I was an you know, American, you know, whatever funding body, whoever, Sundance, PBS, whoever, and someone came to me and said, I've got the story behind that news story, the real people and what really happened to them. And the will probably put, be quite interested in putting some money behind that. But sometimes funding is actually touch and go, because sometimes great stories don't actually get funding because I often find that broadcasters and big funders, they always have an agenda. So you will find that when the Arab Spring happened, most of the work that was being funded was actually around the Arab Spring. You know, when Mugabe was busy uh, doing what he was doing in Zimbabwe, he was demonized and the funding that was going in there was about that. So there is also that travesty where there is a wave when it comes to films about minorities, where they feel that they can pick and choose. Uh, coming to you as a funder, because <laughs> one of the things that a lot of us have problems with, I mean, I know I've just finished a documentary called um, Child of the Revolution, which has taken me eight years with most of my own money, Partly, well, the BBC had wanted the film, but I didn't want to do it within a year. And I actually wanted to tell the Zimbabwean story in a more holistic, you know, in a more holistic, uh, because it has never been understood in a more holistic uh, manner. And I battled, and now I'm still looking for money for archive. <laughs> And I can't get it. But one of the things is the fact that, you know, a lot of us are very skeptical about funders because funders, you always have an agenda, we feel. And, um, and I can kind of understand that, that if I have money, I might want to influence how that money is spent. So it is really certain funders were absolutely fabulous, like uh, funders from, from Holland, because the Dutch are the biggest um, philanthropic funders when it comes to actually film uh, throughout the, 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 you know, because American money, yes, they give money, but most of their funding is for American films. So I mean it within the context of if you're African, if you're Asian, or if you are from the South, you know, the Dutch give the most money. And they actually don't put too much emphasis on editorial control. So can you speak a bit about your fund and um, do you understand when artists or filmmakers say, you know what, I need copyright, I need editorial control, and how do you straddle that? Well, it's nice to be on this panel because you're making me feel better and better as a funder. <laughs> really, um, because our particular fund, uh, you know, I didn't see it as that out of, out of uh, the norm in America. We do film internet, we do support international films. We've supported two of Sinan's mm -hmm. films, one project, uh, Kashmir, and one about a Pakistani man. Uh, so, so it's not a national uh, <coughs> emphasis particularly, although most of our uh, grantees have been American. That shouldn't be a surprise. We give seed grants, so we don't know where this, and to only to documentary, we don't know where the story's gonna go, and in a great documentary, neither does the director at the outset. You know, life takes its turns. We have no editorial control. We don't seek editorial control. Uh, when the grant applications come into the foundation, um, I have found that our board is very willing to, to take the story to the issues that are going on in the world. We just, we just gave a seed grant to a film called 10 Questions You're Not Allowed to Ask about Israel and Palestine. So we will go to the issue. What we don't support is a director coming in and saying, Muslims are bad. 
you know, just this sweeping, you know, we, we're not going to go there because we don't believe that that's, that's where human rights, uh, we're, very, we're very oriented to, to um, increased understanding. Yeah, so, and we also have a fiscal sponsorship program um, where, we, where we support each fiscal sponsee. We pay for them to have one-on-one -on -one consultations with impact experts so that they can reach the widest audience with their message and have some impact. You know, which grassroots organizations are going to want to see your film, but more importantly, which subset of those grassroots organizations are going to want to do something about the message of your film? That's where our financial support comes in for each fiscal sponsee. So we're very, um, but you made me feel great because we don't, we don't even talk about their agenda. They do have to give us a very solid narrative, um, a compelling story, a character-driven story. But you know, we know that they're not, we don't know where they're gonna take it. One of the films that's being screened tonight is Center in Mecca. We had no idea where that was gonna go because it was an already outed gay man who'd done Jihad for Love, and he was going on the Hajj, and obviously homosexuals aren't allowed in Mecca, and he was going to film it, and that's also not been approved, um, except for one or two exceptions. So, so we're willing to um, go to the issue, but we're not willing to say that all people of a certain belief are bad. Um, and, and so the filmmaker has their agenda, and um, if it isn't a sweeping put down of a race or a people, then then we'll entertain the motion. Coming to you. I just want to find out from you, um, because you've done some work for PBS. Mm -hmm. uh, and PBS is seen as uh, the national broadcaster, but actually PBS is now pandering to advertising. So that, I mean, the BBC doesn't take any advertising. So the, 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 the notion of PBS <coughs> being a public broadcaster is slightly distorted because you can get money from, I know because I watched the American Masters, I used to enjoy that. So either money came from Shell, never mind the fact that uh, Ken Saromiwa was killed, you know, partly because he was actually campaigning against what Shell was doing to the Dogon people. And so in terms of your work that you have put on, on PBS, and um, have you had a situation whereby maybe they might not want money coming from, because that's also something else. I mean, like, there are certain people who've wanted to give me money, and I say, I can't take your money, because if I want to sell that product to the BBC, they are not going to show it, because um, it's important where money is coming from. It's only lately that you will find a situation whereby um, the, the lottery in England has been funding a lot of good films, but there was an old age debate of how the lottery was not clean money, so to speak. How have you dealt with that in terms of your own independence, mm -hmm. in terms of who's financing and when something has gone on PBS? I mean, PBS uh, more recently has had issues with, with the independent film and filmmakers, but more so around this idea that um, documentaries uh, in America don't get the same the higher ratings as some of these other programs that are more entertainment based and so you do you do see a, a shift over to airing of uh, Downton Abbey on uh, American public television as opposed to um, independent lens or POV mm -hmm. having which are two major uh, documentary strands in, in the US um, and that's a that's a separate discussion because what I have found personally is that when it comes to actually funding within ITVS, which is the independent television service, which is the independent film di division funder in PBS, is that that actually does not play a part at all. Mm -hmm. People have been very open. I've sat on many of their funding commission panels as well, where the conversation comes up very clearly is who is making this film? Are they from the community that uh, is speaking, are, or are they an outsider? Are they looking at a story from diverse voices uh, and perspectives? And actually, it's been a, a real support. And within the PBS system, there's there are divisions. So there's the National Black Programming yeah. Consortium. There's the Native American programs. There's the Asian Americans. Um, so and Latino Public Broadcasting. So there's a real push. For myself, with funding, we were talking about this earlier. Um, 
that with making Project Kashmir, I found that instead of going to our own communities outside of the broadcaster funder world, I, we chose not to go with individuals from within our community to fund us for that very specific reason when you're dealing with conflict um, and a conflict zone by taking money from certain places mm -hmm. you compromise your filmmaking. It would have been very simple and easy and we mm -hmm. had offers from, from producers and um, wealthy individuals who said, you know, go ahead and make this film but then you're going to have to, you know, listen to us at least give, give you notes. And so then it, it compromises you in the way that you not only um, cut your movie, but when you're shooting your movie and, and developing your idea. So it's important, I think, uh, to get a, have a relationship early on with whoever's funding you to, to talk about what your point of view is and, and not just be this conversation about how much is that check going to be so I can finish um, you know, my archival research, but really about the storytelling because ultimately funders are there to give their money away. That's their job. They have to find good quality projects. And if you approach a funder with this idea that um, I'm here to help you do your job, I think that's a, that's a really smart way to look at it because they have to do this. So you have to find a way to, to make it easy for them as well. Um, I, I want to... Uh ask you if you've been in conflict with any, when you've given money and then the product comes and you think, but hang on a minute, you know, this is probably promoting that or promoting that and we don't, how have you dealt with that? Because, I mean, for instance, I mean, uh, you've got the Israeli and Palestinian issue, which many people don't really, really want to get to the nitty gritties of that. And I always find that in terms of international and global reportage, there is always a bias, okay? And that, unless if you are getting money to say, well, actually, I want to create a peace dialogue between the Palestinians and the Israelis, then I will give you money. But if you really want to look at the issue deep, deep down, many funders, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? So, I mean, I'm just asking, I'll just give you an example about the Israeli and Palestinian issue. If you've had a situation with whoever you funded, and something has not quite come out. I can only think of one time when I really wrestled with whether Hartley Film Foundation, not me personally, but Hartley Film Foundation should be in the credits as a donor. Uh, I didn't want the foundation to be um, uh, the reputation to be tarnished, and I wasn't sure where the film was going. So I asked that we, we gave the funds, and I had no regrets personally, but as the director of the foundation, I had concerns. And we took our name just off the donors, so we were anonymous, but that's okay. Um, and I wish we hadn't taken okay. our name off. Okay. That's the only time. Okay, no, because we are living in a world where political correctness, correctedness is killing us, especially as documentary right. filmmakers. And uh, often it's like, oh, you know, how are the Americans going to take this? And I'm always being told, and I say, no, I, can, I don't want to make a film for Americans. I don't want to make a film for British people. I want to make a film that I want to watch. But um, I, I would also be interested in us exploring uh, African governments, Asian governments, because it's one thing us complaining about funding. It's one thing us as uh, the other complaining about how we are portrayed, you know, in global media. But um, governments from the South are not coming on board in terms of creating funding mechanisms. Where then we can go to some of these funders and say that I have raised so much money and also then I also want to touch about co-production treaties as mm -hmm. well, because like you're doing this film, maybe you could work with African countries mm -hmm. that maybe have a co-production treaty with, because it's all about money mm -hmm. that we are talking about. Um, Cyrus, as a person who's always been quite prolific in terms of creating African content, how do you feel about the fact that um, African governments are not coming on board 
in terms of taking artists seriously, or not even governments, African philanthropists, because we've got quite a few billionaires on the continent, we've got quite a few multimillionaires, and there'll be the same people to complain. I mean, I remember Wole Shoyinka complaining about that uh, documentary series that was on Nigeria, on, 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 you know, and I was thinking, fair enough, you can complain, but Nigeria is the eighth largest producer of oil, with the money, are they giving money as, you know, because I think we need to touch on that. Because we will always go cap in hand to, to, to white philanthropists in terms of wanting money to make our films. And I think that there is a problem with that. You know, first of all, two things. I, I, I mean, I wish in this sort of sessions we do have more of you uh, or the, the commissioning editors present because I think the essence of this sort of debate is to see how um, you know uh, we can change the game as, as far as the way um, we are giving or empowering storytellers to be able to tell their stories freely and uh, it is it is sad because Africans are the master storytellers. Storytelling started in Africa, and then the the the, the, the game changed. Um, Westerners came, and the stories started getting told within boxes, radios, and TV, and so on. And clearly, when the game changed, most of the politicians realized, or or or, or the money people in Africa, as far as they're concerned, it's not in their interest the way the stories are now being told. Because when the West came in, it's all about transparency. It's the it's it's dealing with corruption. It's actually um, peeling some of the uh, bad things that are happening in the continent, and. You know, I sometimes sit down, you know, I, we, we just got funding from, again, an, an American philanthropist, serious money to do a story for the very first time. This is somebody who actually said to me, look, your country has gone through um, wars, Ebola and um, corruption and stuff. What about the resilience, the strength of the Sierra Leonean people? You know, how can you tell that story? And you know, so I was like, yes. And I found somebody through whom I can channel this story to tell the strength about the strength of the Sierra Leonean people. But the politicians, you know, a particular, um, I'll name names, uh, uh, um, Jaimon Honsum, some of you know him. Um, we worked together on Blood Diamond. You know, he was the, 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 the lead to mm -hmm. DiCaprio. I said to Jaimon, I always wanted to do the story about zombie because as far as I'm concerned, the narrative that is out there about zombie is not the correct um, narrative. We need to change it. And, um, you know, so I said to him, can we do it? Because he comes from Benin. And uh, we went around trying to raise funds. Um, it didn't happen. So here is here are three things that I have been doing to try and you know bypass some of these conventional ways of raising funds. I said let's do a, and a lot of people are doing it. It's not new, but it's just that perhaps we need to lean a little bit more on that. I said let's just do a short video, and we did a short video of a different version of zombie um, lifestyle in Benin and we put it out there and um, you know we have almost got the money that we need from um, just using YouTube but also crowdsourcing is something that we have been using mm -hmm. and, and my my just what, what almost everyone was saying you know when I go to people that I believe whether it's NGOs or whether it's mm -hmm. people like you who can give money the first thing I do is it's what you said actually put the cards on the table and say this is the film I want to make and if you want to buy into that film Bingo. If not, you know, then we know that actually, you know, we, we, are, we are having, a, a, we're coming from different, different lines. And then one last thing for me is that sometimes if I want to tell a story, say, um, to do with the US or, or to do with the UK, it is, it is interesting, it is clever to find the link. As long as, say, if I want to do a story uh, about migrants, 
I make sure that, you know, I find the UK link to tie the UK to realize that, okay, because they will give us that excuse or why should the UK audience be interested? But when you find the link, then you know that you know they have no more excuse. They will have to fund that film. So that's why that's how I play. But African leaders, African philanthropists, the money people, they are not interested. I've tried this many, many times. Okay. They're just not interested. I reckon that you and me must team up and just go and <coughs> we'll get the money. We'll get there, but don't forget, the danger is, this is why for me, those who are back home are the heroes, yes. you know, because those journalists, those storytellers back home, they are still pushing, even though, you know, it's at serious personal risk. You know, for me, I'm, I'm a fraud, in fact, because I'm protected here. Those people back there, they are the real heroes. Yeah, so we'll employ them when we get the money. Exactly. I want to touch on something that's very important. In terms of... Um, demographics race de i'm just going to take england as a because we are here and uh, the bbc is everywhere all over the world in 2013 2050 uh, england 30 percent of their population is actually going to be um, ethnic at this point in time one in four children that are being born in this country are actually from ethnic minorities so what i don't understand is that yes you've got an equity legislation with the BBC and they talk about diversity as well but in terms of demographics when we watch television we are not seeing was it one thing white companies getting money and telling black stories that's not where the empowerment is the empowerment is black companies getting money and creating content on the national broadcaster. And um, so the, the, the figures don't tally in terms of uh, the ethnic minorities that you've got in this country. And has there been a concerted effort? Because I know that in America, in the 80s, black filmmakers came together, went to Hollywood, and told them that African Americans constitute a certain percentage of ticket sales in this country. So it is important for you to finance black films. So it is important for black production companies, Indian production companies, and the other in terms of minorities to be getting a piece of the pie. How is that squaring up here in the yeah. UK? Because we are fighting that battle in South Africa by the way, you know, as, as black filmmakers, and you would think that it's easier, but actually, although I do think that our government has, has made a lot of strides. You know, it, I know there is a drive at the moment to, you know, try and even things out in terms of black people's representation here in England, in front of and behind the camera. Mm -hmm. And um, Lenny Henry's been a part of that drive, and. You know, the um, film and television industry in this country, I think there's a degree of, of uh, justifiable embarrassment, because it, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's actually yeah. ridiculous. It, you, I think they looked at it and said, actually, it got worse than it was in the 70s. Because uh -huh. when I was a kid, I grew up and you didn't see many black faces on TV. There was Trevor McDonald. So yeah. whenever the news came on, even though you were four, you'd rush into the living room. Yes. You didn't have a like, clue what was Sir like, Trevor was a black face on TV. Sir so, Trevor. It's amazing. <laughs> but um, no, there is, uh, you know, there has been a drive and an initiative. I can't say I've really particularly felt the benefits of it myself personally. And, you know, I, I have a, a network and I'm always interested to see who else is out there as black practitioners. But I remember you know, my experience was sort of around about sort of the early 90s. There was a feeling of a collective and there was a, you know, I don't know, it was, it was a, I think people were, were over here were very inspired actually by, again, across that Atlantic, despite these, you know, yep. she's got to have yep. it, just yep. come yep. out. Yep. 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 And that just seems to have dissipated. I've really got that feeling. Was, and so I guess I'm kind of thinking how much of it is sort of, our lack of our own initiative and you know sense of solidarity and being proactive 
and how much of it is what it also is, which is um, you know the powers that be not sort of being fair, and you know, and then I have the question: Well, how much of it is asking for help and for equity and all that? And how much of it is just going out and creating it and getting it and and, and you know? Uh, uh, I, I mean, I think part of the problem in raising money for our our type of films is that the amount of money out there is is small chunks. So, you know, $5,000, $10,000 or for PBS with their um, diversity initiatives is about $15,000 and you're giving away your North American first look deal to PBS for $15,000. Con continues to, um, and not just PBS, but continues to ghettoize uh, filmmakers because you, you're never working with enough money. So you're always in that begging position. So I think there, there's a great need for a fund, a diversity fund, which can step in with $250,000 so that you can get to a place or, or more so that you can finish a film and not be beholden to um, spending several years just trying to raise the money to finish it. Um, I would imagine that very soon I'm going to be asked to wrap this up, but I am very interested in asking a very important question as to how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to deal with the notion of the North and South divide in terms of resources? And how are we going to deal with this issue of, um, of funding? Of, because we know the power of images, but, uh, and also we know actually how documentary, like any important or valid story, can actually change societies, change perceptions. And I think that it is something that we should um, collectively fight for. You know what I mean? Whether it is engaging with civil society, whether it is engaging with governments, whether we like it or not. Like for instance, South Africa does actually have co-production treaties. And there is no reason why um, Sierra Leone cannot, even if they are not coming with money, but if I am going to go and work in Sierra Leone with a Sierra Leonese um, producer, if there is a co-production treaty, there are certain battering things that can be put to the table for the project to become complete. And so those, and, and African countries don't have co-production treaties you know, with other African countries. So I'm interested, you as a funder, you were talking about this project, you are doing migration, and you are going, you know what I mean, and you know, you're going to be working in the African continent. How, yeah. well, how are we going to deal with this problem? Because it's a problem, but it's not enough for us to complain about the problem. I do think that, that we should take a look at what's going on on the ground in terms of the digital masses. And we've certainly seen in terms of in America, there's a movement towards um, VOD and download. And, and I think in that direction, you, you're getting quite, quite a, a big audience. And um, so I do think the answer is, I mean, and certainly in Africa, there's digital networks. So uh, and in other other developing countries, um, I think it's it's a good time because there's an opportunity to change the narrative because these new content providers aren't necessarily, you know, um, in tune with the narrative of the BBC, for example, and some of these uh, more established mainstream media. In fact, at the moment, there I think they're at they're at odds. Um, and so, so for example, a film like the film we're making, which is, which is in a sense a kind of, I would like to say, it, it follows the activism movement. You, you will find someone like Netflix would yeah. be interested in a project yes. like that mm -hmm. because they are on the ground and they're aware of their followers and so on. And. Um, more so than, you know, I'm not saying, t I mean, to be fair, some of the main mainstream media is also looking into this new brand audience. So they're, that's pushing them to, to, to switch their narrative. Um, and so, yeah, so I think, I think I'm, I'm being optimistic, essentially. And I think, so the, the, the idea of crowdsourcing is now meeting 
you know, the kind of Netflix, you know, you see obviously Amazon, you see some of these big organization are now moving towards that VOD and so because they know that's how they can um, reach this big market and a global market as well. And so in terms of, I'm assuming in terms of Africa, what is Nigeria, South America, where you have critical mass, the idea I guess is to, you know, if you can get the audience using VOD, then, then there's power there and, it, and, and essentially it would be well, what is it that they want to see? So it means you have to provide the narrative of what they want to see. But um, in terms of co-production and treaties, I think that's something else that is a, a positive because it's happening. There's a global. Mo- I think we're now living. It's you know, we're living border in a kind of bordered and borderless society at the same time. It, it, you know, th- there's this sense of. The Americans, the you, uh, the you know, they are now looking outwards, and you know, and they are looking outwards to to Europe, to Africa, to, you know, and and there's a join up thinking, and I think I think it's never a better time for co-productions. The one question I didn't ask, which is really important: documentaries don't normally make money. Some of them, some of them. So some investors will say, I'll give you money, am I gonna get my money back? And we know that certain documentary filmmakers put bums on the seats, and we know some don't, but it is a very, very important tool for storytelling. Just like how we know certain filmmakers who are well known when they started making films, they didn't make money, but institutions like the Smithsonian kept those uh, people you know, with bread and butter and all of that because they were seen as people who were important in terms of a cultural movement in a country. How do you deal with that when a funder says that I want my money back? Because in most instances we raise money from funds such as yours, which are fabulous, you don't uh, you are actually helping, it's philanthropic, but there are certain funders who want their money back. How do you deal with that? So you mean they, they want to see, well certainly the film we're making and, and, and dealing with um, BFI, um, not so much Sundance, but they want to see, we, they want to see us engaging with an audience. Um, I think that's a primary thing. And I mean, we as filmmakers would like to engage with a big audience as well. Um, and I, but I think we need to come back to the narrative for that. And, we, and, it, and it's a broader conversation about the types, the, doc, the documentary form, really. And, um, and certainly, it, it may well be a different discussion, but there is a conversation being had around issue-led documentaries and character-driven documentaries and, you know, and documentaries in a style where it's, it's you know, it's entertaining in some respect. Um, so, you know, famously Michael Moore discussion around, you know, you know, make a kind of movie, make something that everybody wants to watch. And so I think, um, well, George can pick up on this. With, you know, if he thinks he's making films. And we're going to be rounding out right. just in terms of asking the audience if they have questions. And then we'll come and round up. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, uh, Dion's made a good point. Uh, you know, what do you, you know, I mean, first of all, you know, some funders might want their money back, but maybe you might have to just say, okay, see you later kind of thing, because you ain't going to get your money back, you know. I mean, you know, there might, or you know, sometimes I think, well, realistically, okay, you can get your money back once the film recoups and this gets paid, and that person who with a deferred payment gets paid for the work they did, and then, and then, in other words, you're not going to get your money back, you know. But anyway, yeah, or you, you, know, look at, you look at funders who who understand the double bottom line, right? Mm. So the the bottom line is that you're going to make a film that maybe character driven but yet has subtext and and has themes that reach out to the social issue causes that you're interested in. So you can make something that's um, more commercial of a project but yet you're actually um, moving forward with your social impact themes. And just by showing certain stories um, you're making an impact. You know, by, by funding certain people, certain 
areas, certain groups, you're actually making that impact and that is getting your money back. You're putting money where the power is. Have you seen a curve in terms of people asking for money, how they ask for money, say maybe 10 years ago and now? Have you seen a difference in terms of applications, in terms of, uh, how do I put this? In terms of, you know, whether stories are character driven, you know, I mean, have you seen a change? I'm not so sure. That's fine, to, you know, we're, because we're at the beginning stage. Uh, everyone's hanging by their fingernails, and they're putting their own money into the film as documentarians. So, uh, mm. you know, they haven't. They're looking for the first funder, of course, but they're also, you know, yeah. No, I haven't. Have you? Listen, no, I, mean, I just really don't. Um, have I, seen, I, I think you know, uh, filmmakers have to be be savvy in how to speak about impact. Yeah. And in a way, it's also become it's become it's almost made us have two jobs, right? So or three jobs or five jobs that we all do and not get paid for is that we, after making your film, you then have to create a whole campaign and go out there and do these social impact work, and that's been really difficult because that's not who we are necessarily. We're storytellers, so I think there has to be some expectation from funders as well to. Um, if you're funding impact, maybe it's not the filmmaker who makes the impact plan. It's you're funding an outreach producer. And that's, that's um, something that if you can get that money earlier, then it, it frees you up to, to work with that producer to help you tell your story, not do that at the, at the end. And, and maybe that'll help some of this, relieve some of this pressure of like, am I, is this a good investment for me as a funder? because I'm not sure if they can actually deliver all these ideas that they have. Well, filmmakers are just trying to make their movies. I, I, think, start I think I understand that better. I, you know, if, if a filmmaker is applying for us, they say, we're going we're gonna to go for broadcast and festivals. Well, that doesn't tell me enough about where, you, where, you really, where your intention is going. So we wouldn't accept that as an outreach plan. But am I aware that filmmakers are now, as opposed to a, a long time ago, being asked to wear all the hats, yes, that, that is, and it's impossible, mm -hmm. which is why our fiscal sponsorship program works with them at the beginning to develop an outreach program. That's why we pay for those consultants to help them because we can't expect them. But again, we also do expect them to say more than, well, we're going for broadcast and festivals. Mm -hmm. That won't pass either. So, so yes, I mean, I think, I, think it's, I think it's way too much onto the director and producer um, at this stage as opposed to what it used to be when you simply handed your film off, lost your rights to the, to, to the distributor. Yes, of course I mean, we, we feel, in the, in the uh, United States, we feel like the model here is a little bit better in the sense that we've now become so driven with social impact that these character-driven stories, the smaller stories, somehow get passed up. And you have to have a huge campaign to be able to get the money, and here at least you have the opportunity to find those smaller stories. And, well, also, there's so much um, emphasis in the United States on the metrics of how you measure impact. I don't know what they are. I don't know how you measure impact. I, I don't know. And, and they have um, long treaties about how you do it this way and this way and this way. And I'm thinking of the filmmaker just being blurry with trying to figure out how to present themselves and what they're trying to get across. Um, we don't have much time left. And I think it's important for us to put this to the floor if anyone wants to ask questions to our fantastic panelist. Hi, my name is Mark. Um, I'm a filmmaker from Singapore. I'm at the film screen here, and I've just been filming in Tanzania so I've been around for a few years. Um, I would like to get some advice. So I'm a Singaporean filmmaker making a film in Tanzania. Um, and I have a film in Sheffield, so that's my first foray into the international stage. Uh, how do I access funds um, in, in North America and Europe? Because I'm relatively unknown, and it's, I can't find a link to the UK or to the US to get a story made. So, yeah, I would appreciate any advice on that. Well, I mean, for starters, it has to be something that they're interested in. So we have to really think about the narrative itself or the story. I mean, and, it, and is there a link to the UK or America? Or if it is a pretty much a, a Tanzanian story, is it a, 
uh, a big story. I mean, uh, for starters, I know, for example, Ford Foundation may be interested in projects that is dealing with um, issues relating to governments and bad practices and so on. And, you know, uh, Some of it but it's depending on the story, some of it is kind of doing your homework because you're here, you're, in the, you're at the Sheffield Dock Festival in the UK and mm -hmm. like if you go through the, the programme of films that have been made and look at any films that have been made about Africa and then look who's funded them and if the funding's come from the US or the UK, then there's something you might want to look at. You might then have to look at, okay, you might need to link up with a US or UK based producer potentially. And, you know, you, we talk about six degrees of separation, you're about one degree of separation because you're here. You're here. I mean, what is the story about? And I, I would also say, um, when, with my first film, what I did is I didn't necessarily look up, uh, link up with a producer. At that point, I wasn't, um, I, I wasn't at that, that savvy level where you needed, and I was already based in, in North America. But what I did is I built an advisory board around my film. So there are people who are like-minded who may have interests, like any of these people on the, the panel, that you can come and talk to and say, you know, this is of interest and I could really use your guidance because I'm a young filmmaker starting out. Can you help me? And by putting names that are known to other funders on your um, application really helps give you a gravitas to say that this person's done their homework and they're asking the right questions to the right people. And if I may give you advice as an African, Please work with an African person from Tanzania as your partner because we are so tired as Africans seeing people come in, make films, and totally, totally disempower our people. So that is something that I really get pissed off when people come into Africa. They have their own perceptions on Africa. And when they employ Africans, Africans are only drivers or, you know, I think that if you want to create something that is decent in a foreign land, uh, respect is fundamental. And respect comes through working with people, natives, as, as equals. It will only make your work much better. And I lived in the UK for longer than I lived in Romania. However, um, I still uh, notice in the corner of my eye the um, unconscious, uh, subconscious bias uh, that uh, my colleagues from various productions or, or funders have in the UK. And I'm just wondering, I was interested in your your, your stories, um, that even though you were born in Britain, you've got a Ghanaian background and so on. I, I was wondering if any of you um, have come across um, any information that actually the diversity charter is effective in any way. Um, very briefly, I've been involved in two programs recently, two, two types of... Very briefly. Very briefly. Um, that have shown a lot of cultural bias. Um, one of them, I was a producer on a celebrated series called The Romanians Are Coming, um, being one of the very few Romanians in the industry I, I get a call, and although it went very well, uh, done very well with the British press, basically the Romanians were very angry, um, and uh, to some extent myself. The, the second one, uh, Channel 4 sent the productions down to um, Southampton to do the Immigration Street series, and they were packed. Um, they went off, they managed to run the film. I was invited by the university. To Very work briefly, my dear. Yeah. Very briefly. Um, and I managed to make sort of one film, um, mm -hmm. which is not going to be shown on British television, and the second one. So the question is have you found that the diversity charter is effective, and uh, how do you deal with the subconscious bias? I think you answered that. I've asked about that. It's fine. Am I answering that? No, no, you do. He asks you. But I'm, I'm just saying that you, you spoke about it earlier on. Yeah. Um, well done, by the way, for you know, achieving what, what you've achieved. And you know, carry on. And don't, don't be disheartened. You know. And, um, uh, I, you know I, 
What, sorry, what exactly is the question <laughs> you're asking? I think it's all right to answer you. It, it's, 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 it's effective, I've found, in sort of getting me through the door and getting me into a room and sitting down. But, you know, you know I'm trying, struggling not to sound cynical, but I found, by the end of it, I found I'm no better off. You know, I kind of, I tend to think, well, I just spent some money on my Oyster card to make that journey to that office. And, and I'm in deficit by a five pounds fifty. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? So that's, but you know, the, there's another way of looking at it as well. Where it, got, it gets you through the door, and then you know, you, 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 it's better than if it wasn't there at all, because you know, it's not a level playing field, and it's a start, and uh, you know, if, hopefully, it, it will get better. And perhaps. Can I just, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Can I just say, I mean, the film that you, you made that wasn't show, I don't know whether it was um, funded by a third party, because we've got to be fair to the broadcast, it was it. Now, that is the problem. We've got to be fair to the broadcasters as well. You know, there is um, an Ofcom uh, BBC rule in yeah. this country in particular that says that if your uh, uh, theme is funded by a third party that is not a broadcaster, yeah. then it shouldn't be aired. And those reasons, those rules are there for a reason, because to be honest, uh, um, again, it's what we're saying, he who pays the piper, you know, there's that assumption that he who pays the piper calls the tune. So if somebody gives you you, a third party who's not a, um, um, a broadcaster somehow gives you money. It, it, there is a possibility that when the you know that person will influence your your, your decision, they will taint the film that you you want to make. So that is a problem. That is possibly the reason why your your film was not aired. And and the good thing about that rule, quickly, is that. It, 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 it serves as some kind of a protection for the, the, the viewers here. It's a yes. good thing that the viewers have yeah. got because they know that when uh, um, a film is actually funded by the broadcaster, between the broadcaster and the journalist or the filmmaker, they know that when they switch to watch that film, they're watching a film that is not influenced by a third party. So I think that's why your film. So in the future, that is something you've got to be cautious about. Um, any questions? Well, I mean, what's to stop Al Capone giving you money? And, you know, it's, it's, it's very important that that thing of quote-unquote dirty money is an issue for certain people who are television paying licensed people. But sorry, but what is what you can do again, we'll go back to crowdsourcing. Because the good thing about crowdsourcing, before you actually start looking for that money, you will put everything out there. And so whoever brings their money buys into what you have outlined. So that is a fair deal. So, you know, people think it's a little bit difficult, but, you know, you take the Nuba people, for instance, there is a, these people have been struggling in South Sudan for years. Nobody talks about them. Mm -hmm. Western media is not interested. Mm -hmm. But they managed to find uh, a few people people who have helped them with crowdsourcing, and you'll be surprised. They're getting more than perhaps they're looking for every day. So maybe that's, that's one area that we should, it's, it's difficult, but that's one area that we should start looking more and more. Um, yes, any more questions? Ah, okay. Um, we're going to have the closing remarks, because I'm, I'm sure time is up, right? Well, we've got, we've got about what? Okay, that's fine. No, 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 no. We can still talk some more. Um, There's a question. Yes. The mic. Hello, my name is Ruslan, and I'm just starting to make documentary films. And my question: You mentioned that it's very hard to get um, money from funders and from production companies, and also you mentioned crowdfunding. From your experience, do you feel that crowdfunding uh, getting more popular, it's more easier to get money? And also, what do you think in the future, is it the best way to speak to your audience? 
Um, you, who has had experience? See, I'm always weary. I have to be honest. Crowdfunding, I know people who've got money, and it is getting e easier. But I'm always worried that if uh, maybe a, a, a pedophile or somebody gives me money and then it comes out, and this award-winning film, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then stuff like that comes out. So I'm really, really always weary, you know, in terms of, maybe it's because I'm such a control freak. I want to know where the money is coming from, <laughs> then I can defend. But that, those are my fears because it is actually becoming an easier way of raising money. But can someone talk about that who has had the experience of crowdfunding? Well, <laughs> we, we, we had a situation. Um, I, I made a film that uh, we actually followed um, the Rwanda national team because, again, we thought at the time, you know, the Rwandese national team, 17 years on after these children were born during the genocide, we thought, what a big film. But um, it was a good news story because these youngsters have qualified to go play for the World Cup in Mexico. And nice. um, the Western media, that's good news story, it doesn't sell because it's not bleeding. So nobody would buy the story. So we um, actually you know, wrote to a few people and we put it out there and we, we got money. And um, I understand where you're coming from. <laughs> we got money from all over the place. And um, you know, in the end, we made a very, very strong film. And the BBC um, was gonna air the film and just, you know, they trailed the film, everything, very strong film. And just a day before the film was aired, one person pointed out that um, one of the organizations that has funded this uh, film uh, is somehow linked to, I'm not sure whether it was Kagami or whatever. And um, this, mm. this film has been trailed on the BBC, um, you know, that very evening, you know, we did everything, but they had to, to pull the film. Yeah. So that's a risk. But for like um, someone like you, what I did in the beginning when I started struggling making films in Sierra Leone, I actually focused on NGOs. Mm. Because the thing about NGOs, again, you have to actually, that perhaps most of what you will do for NGOs is not for broadcast. Mm. Maybe it's just for their website and stuff like that. It will be used to make money, but it's a learning process because you learn how to do a lot of things because you can use cheap smartphones and free uh, 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 um, softwares to edit this film so it would be reasonable. You know, we, we just need to start getting our heads around ways that we can bypass this conventional because to be honest, it is, uh, it is getting more and more difficult, you know, to get the conventional funding. But the fantastic thing is that equipment is getting more accessible film is actually becoming more accessible to working class people. And I think that that is great because it has always been in the domain of the white male, but now you can actually make a film on a cell phone. How good or how what you put it out there, it's a start. Hi. I'm glad you spoke about the cap in hand that, that you know, how do we go and get money from, from people where we come from, philanthropists. It is a big thing in South Africa to try and raise money from the, the billionaires that we have. I don't know if any of the panelists has been fortunate in trying to raise money from philanthropists and, and, and what was it they convinced them to, to, you know, what did they say? Because a lot of times, like George mentioned, you're not going to recoup your money in many cases in documentaries. So how, how when you have convinced uh, philanthropists, what do you say to them to get them to give you money? Because I know you're not near there. So I, I know, can I just say one thing? I know one thing works. If you know, you know, it could be, I've heard stories where it could be, we're going to go to the Cannes Film Festival together, and we're going to hang out, there's going to be movie stars, we're going to be on a yacht, there's going to be people in bikinis who look lovely. <laughs> And your name's going to be all over the film, and they, they, they've got you know funding to the tune of a lot of money as a result. So I mean, some of it I just think is you know you you know you've got to you 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 you've got to be selling something. You've got to be selling something, and 
um, it might not be that it, you're going to recoup on your investment, but you, you know, this is going to be a, a great um, uh, promotional opportunity for you because the film's going to be seen, you know, far and wide, and it's going to be it's going to play in all of these different platforms and whatnot, and you know. So I think it's just a case of really just trying to think of. What you know? What you've got? You, you 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 know? If you're asking someone for all that kind of money, then what is it that you know is going to appeal to them? What are you selling? I think that more so than that, it's just that you know this is a great cause and this is a worthy. You've got to start try and put yourself a, a little bit in their shoes. Now uh, you have people like Mo Ibrahim. You know, sorry. That's fine. No, no, I was just going to say to you, it's how you sell uh, and what you sell to some of these people. Because you have people like Mo Ibrahim, who deals with um, corruption mm -hmm. in Africa. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you, 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 know, you know that you want to do a film about corruption, you know, you can challenge. So it's knowing the people, knowing what they want to buy to, buy into, mm -hmm. knowing the brand. It's just about doing your homework. I had a very, please don't tweet this. But I had a very, very interesting situation where I got money from uh, Camille Cosby to make a film and a long time ago. And fortunately, it is her name which is on my film. Because with all these sex scandals that have been coming out, you know, about Bill Cosby, I don't think that I could have aired that film afterwards if it says, you know what I'm trying to say? So the point I'm trying to make is that it is also a gamble. Mm. Because mm. you can get money today from Mr. Facebook and your film will do very well and then maybe after two years you want to show it, but Mr. Facebook maybe gets involved in some terrible scandal mm. and no one is going to want to touch your film. So there are also all of those considerations when you go to individuals to get money from them. I, hi, my name is Sarah. I just want to follow up on Mo Ibrahim because he doesn't fund media. I think this is part of the question: is he does obviously great work with the Transparency Index, and that's amazing. I'm not saying why does he not focus on the thing that matters to him, but I think this is the question that you are asking, and I think it is the elephant in the room. Why aren't people, I know Africa better than I know Asia, but so I can speak to African millionaires and billionaires. I mean, there's, you mentioned Nigeria. There's how many billionaires, billionaires and billionaires. billionaires in Nigeria? So I, I really do think that this is the question. How do we find the Mo Ibrahim who wants to fund African film? Like, he's doing great with the transparency index. Who is that person or who are those people? on the continent who want to make that step to start talking about transparently telling those stories coming from the continent. We have Bertha Foundation is one of them. Bertha, Bertha Foundation. Is Dutch. It's South African. No, it's a South, South African. African. The South African woman. Okay. Two, no, but two, you're two, right. Isn't two men. In, in Sorry? Isn't it administered through its life? I mean, it has, uh, the, the... Okay. Great. Blue eyes. Okay, okay. No, but it's a strong point that you've made. You're right. I mean, we have been knocking. We've, um, I just mentioned Mo Ibrahim because I thought corruption. But, you know, I, we've gone to him as well. We've gone to most of I've these gone, key players in, 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 in Africa. It's, they're not interested. You know, this is not making them quick money. They are even scared that you will be exposing dirty if you come to do stories. So, so it's a long way, and I completely agree with you. The best way for now, so far, is the conventional way that at least that money that is coming to you is actually screened, and you know that long term, you're not going to be sleeping with one eye open. Yeah. Can I do a follow-up really quick? Okay, quickly. Just, um it's, it matters to me because I'm developing a TV show that's based in Kenya, and I'm going to the number one um, cell phone company in Kenya, which is called Safaricom, and I, they don't even have any subscribers outside of East Africa. But I'm literally pitching to them, you guys should fund this project because it's an African story. Wouldn't it be better if, instead of Verizon or um, Orange or whatever funding the film, a cell phone provider from the West, even if you don't have subscribers outside of your country, you should ask, it should be an aspiration to 
to fund the films about your own country? And I think this is the question, how do we make that catch? Because I'm trying. I am doing a documentary at the moment on uh, Mandela's peace efforts. I mean, Mandela has been overdone, has been appropriated, but there are no black people. There are there, maybe one or two, who've made films on Mandela because he's been globally appropriated. And I have made the decision that he is um, our institutional memory and I want the money to come from South Africa. And I am knocking on those doors. I haven't applied to any funder. So ask me in a year's time, <laughs> you know, because I'm basically saying to them that, you know, this is your heritage and it should also reside, the, 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 the copyright should also reside with a South African within South Africa. Because if you look at all the stuff that has been done on Mandela, uh, probably maybe only two Africans have done stuff on him and the copyright resides in South Africa. So, um, I've, yeah, I'm, and I'm knocking on those doors. I'm winning, I'm not winning, but I have decided that the money should be South African money. I don't know if I'll succeed. So we can round up then. Yeah. I, I, I need my um, fabulous panel yeah. to round up. And um, I mean, it's not about where to, it's not about being prescriptive, but your insight and your experience is very important, you know, to this panel. So um, please, can you talk? Say something, maybe what I didn't touch on. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think it's the notion of finding the charity or um, foundation um, that deals with the subject matter of what film you're making. So, for example, you have the Wellcome Trust that they are, they are interested in media and they fund science projects. Um, Amnesty, they're involved with media as well, and they all cover certain subjects. I think it's just to squarely find which the, the charity that's um, uh, the charity and the subject matter connect the two things. Um, and so that's in terms of uh, kind of grant funding, but then there's also equity funding. Um, we, we didn't really explore that, but. Uh, um, and perhaps that's to do with more character-driven, more kind of movie-style films. Um, and so one should also consider the type of film they're making and, and the narrative and so on. I've been told to, time is up, one sentence, one sentence. That's it. Well, I'm just hoping that, um, you know, one thing that is missing that perhaps have created this block between us um, filmmakers, journalists, and um, you know those who have the money in Africa, maybe it's the way this Africa has been portrayed over the years. And so maybe it's time that um, we try to change the narratives because there are so many heroes in Africa. So if we perhaps try to start telling the stories about our own heroes, maybe some of this money people will perhaps buy into it because after all, we have our own Batman and stuff like that. So you know maybe maybe just we I'm just thinking allowed here. Okay. We have to find a way to One minute's up. <laughs> I will be looking at applications from Africa with a different eye, so thank you. Oh, that's my girl. <laughs> and please give to African women. <laughs> um, we I didn't touch on gender. I'm a big feminist, and I thought, <laughs> let me take that out. <laughs> no, I, I, I think, Sarah, you bring up a very important point that we have to remember that uh, and I'll say again, I think it's really up to us as filmmakers to help other people understand why mm -hmm. we believe in our stories mm -hmm. so much and help them to figure out why they need to come on board to fund documentaries. I mean, there is a culture in many uh, African countries as well as in Asian countries that, that is film-based, but it's entertainment narrative filmmaking. So uh, documentary is coming to this very interesting tipping point place where you can, you can tell stories, they can make impact, they can be character-driven, they can be socially uh, issue-oriented, and still um, people who've never been in that space before have an opportunity to learn how to fund us, and we have to do that work. Yeah, um, uh, I'm just thinking if I was, you know, because I'm here with, at the end of the process of getting a film made, which has taken me three years, you know, and getting it f funded, fully funded, and there's still bits of funding that probably needs to be done. Um, 
and completed. But I'm just putting myself in the position of if I was here trying to get a film off the ground and it was, you know, just a just basically a, a treatment on paper and not a, you know, not even a, a, a trailer or. I'd, I'd honestly, I think uh, one way I'd, I'd be looking at is just looking through all the films at this festival and looking at all the films in that catalogue and just asking myself the simple question, how was the film funded? Because you've got a lot mm. of the clues already there, yes. just in the details of that catalogue. Yep. And I also think it's fantastic that uh, Sheffield is actually honouring John Akamfra because it actually isn't every day that these international festivals um, have uh, black representation, let alone women. Where are they? Where are the black women? They There's are more, there. More films so by women I think in it is fabulous. Ever, it is, uh, more films by women in the festival this year. Black women, darling. And black women, good. Black women, we're talking about institutional racism. Can we say thank you to so, Connie Swift? <laughs>